In 1917, for the first time that anyone is aware, two educational psychologists wanted to study what was the result of a student going through school and learning history. Um, in the words of their study, they wanted to understand what it meant to have a sense of the past. And so to measure that, they put together a multiple choice test and they went to the state of Texas and they administered it to 1,500 students. And the results are as you can see. Elementary level 16%, high school 33%, college level 49%. And we're used to this narrative. We've heard this argument often that students' knowledge of history is in decline. In 1974, it was in crisis. By 79, it was lamentable. By the early 80s, it had declined and fallen. And by the turn of the 21st century, we had a collective amnesia and a profound historical illiteracy which bodes ill for the future republic. When Jay Leno was employed, he was famous for going out and interviewing people on the streets. And he'd give them a date, and he'd ask them what took place on that date, and then you'd either laugh or cry, depending upon how you saw those responses. Um, there's currently a student group that goes around campuses and administers similar sorts of tests. Uh, there's one that's been floating around from Texas Tech University, where they go around campus and ask people who won the American Civil War. Um, and again, you either laugh or cry, depending upon how you see the results. Um, and we've been told that consistently, we are in decline that students' knowledge of history has been in this rapid decline over the course of the 20th and the 21st century. And what I want to do is to tell you two things. One is good news, and the other is bad news. The good news is, this is not true. Students' knowledge of history is not in decline. There is no evidence that points to a period where students' knowledge was high. And therefore, if you weren't high, you cannot decline. Um, <laughs> that's the good news. <laughs> Sam Weinberg, uh, who's done a, a career's worth of research on uh, teaching history and history and literacy in particular, he looks at these results and he says that what you see is that there's been little change in students' knowledge over time. Um, and he goes on to say, the consistency of these results cast doubts on a presumed golden age of fact retention. There was no point in time that we have a measurement to show that students' knowledge of history was high. That's the good news. And for me, that was enlightening. When I was in my first year of teaching, I felt badly. I kept hearing all these studies, and I would laugh or cry at Jay Leno's interviews. And I felt like something had gone wrong that I was leading my students down a path and wasn't doing a go as good a job as teachers who had preceded me. But the reality is different. The reality is that students' knowledge of history is not in decline. Students' knowledge of history is consistent. The problem is it's consistently low. <laughs> we know in every single measure that we've ever put out there that measures students' knowledge of history, we get dismal results right across the board. If you take the NAEP results going from 1994 to 2010 and you can carry it to 2014, the results are stagnant. The number of students that are proficient in their knowledge of history is minimal. If you think about the college board exam, a three on the college board exam in AP US history generally equates to what percentage of success? I heard somebody whisper something. That would be wonderful. C or an 80 would be wonderful. About a 55%. All we've done is renormed failure and packaged it as a success for US history. Now a five is legit. But statistically, we know that the number of students that earn a five on an AP US history exam is under 5%. And so the question that I posed was why. The research shows three very key things in terms of our practice
that indicate why we're in a situation not of declining student knowledge of history, but a consistently low level. And the first one has to do with the way we teach it. Um, there have been no significant changes to the teaching of history as a discipline in social studies writ large in over a hundred years. Um, Larry Cuban, who was a uh, social studies teacher and then a principal and then a superintendent and then moved on to Stanford, uh, did a massive study in the late uh, 70s and early 80s and he labeled it what he called persistent instruction. The single most dominant method in a high school, middle school, and sometimes elementary school history class is to do what I'm doing right now. One person stands in front of a large group of students, tells them the stories, and then hands them a single source to reinforce what they've told them. And of course, the most used single source is a textbook. And that's with the advent of the film strip, <laughs> the video disc, the CD, and the internet. None of those things have trumped teacher delivery of information and a textbook to support it. And we have research that shows since No Child Left Behind, that has persisted as the dominant form of instruction in our classrooms. And if you look at student data, this comes from Grant Wiggins' uh, research on uh, teacher practice. In which class do teachers lecture the most? History, by far, is at the top. And how long do we do it? At least three quarters of the period. And with many, many, many school districts on a 90-minute period, that's a long time of uninterrupted talk. And if you look at it, what we know is that students who are taught this way, who are taught history as a set of facts that you get, learn very little. And of course, the question is, how do we know that? We have 100 years worth of data now that shows us that we've been teaching it one way, and the results have been consistent. Not a decline, but consistently low.